We tried to tell you. <laughs> we tried to tell you guys. We had a feeling this was going to be a week that would be unique, that would be chaotic, that would provide surprise. That was pretty much our whole takeaway on Thursday is that be careful this week when you go on the road as a ranked team and a bunch of teams messed around and found out. Welcome to Always College Football. It's our Sunday immediate takeaway show. Having watched all these games until 1.30 in the morning, when the game finally went final there in Berkeley, California. Actually, I was probably up just the tiniest bit later than that, watching Texas Tech ultimately pull away there at the end as well. It was a great day of college football, just an amazing day. But let's go through a couple takeaways. The story of the season so far has been Alabama and Kalen DeBoer and just how seamless the transition from Nick Saban to Kalen DeBoer has been and how effortless they've made it look. Well, they became the first one of the probably one of the biggest upsets in the history of Vanderbilt football. It was the first time Vanderbilt has ever beaten a top five team in the AP poll, breaking a 60 game losing streak. There are so many different things I thought that this game was going to be. And I'm going to be honest, I watched this game at halftime last night on the iPad. Watched it at halftime, the coaches tape. So I didn't get to hear any of the commentary. I didn't get to hear anybody. This is my observation. I expected to turn on the tape or for it to feel fluky. I expected to turn on the tape and see Bama looking lethargic. I expected to see Bama making pivotal mistakes that would lead to easy and cheap yardage for Vanderbilt. That's what I expected to see. I was on... Auburn and Georgia calling the game at the exact same time as Alabama and Vandy. So I didn't get to watch any of it live. But what I did not see was a team that looked outrageously hungover. Now, you're going to sit there and say, because all I've read and all I've seen is how, oh, how, how hungover Alabama was. I didn't think that team looked super hungover, if I'm going to be honest. I looked at the other side of the football and I watched Vanderbilt have the ball bounce their way a couple times. The interception back to the house that was tight coverage, bang, bang, play, ball gets tipped, guy picks it, takes it to the crib. That happens. And sometimes the ball doesn't bounce your way. So they got a couple bounces for sure. But more specifically, how they dominated, dominated offensively, how Diego Pavia, and this offensive staff were always seemingly one step ahead, how they were able to completely gas the Alabama defense. This is a defense that played 55 defensive snaps in the second half of the game against Georgia. And now you look fast forward, they were basically on a little bit of roller skates from the very beginning. They were out schemed. I thought Vanderbilt did an amazing job of being aggressive in the four minute situation. Diego Pavias just plays his, he leaves it all on the field every time he plays. They were opportunistic by hitting a fourth and one on, an ama on a play that was well covered and well defended, but an amazing throw, an amazing job by the receiver of tracking the football. I mean, Bama just flat out got outplayed and they were pushed off the line of scrimmage as the game went along. So, I think that we need to stop describing that performance as a, quote, hangover because you are taking it away from Vandy just how well they played. That was a heck of a job there by Clark Lee and the Doors. Uh, another takeaway, watching really the whole day, and for the record, Bama was one of five. I know you've probably heard this already. One of five teams in the top 11 that lost. Bama, Tennessee, Missouri, Michigan, and USC. So not there weren't the only ones. It was a crazy day altogether. We'll go next to Tennessee. I was very surprised at how well Arkansas was able to contain this rushing attack early in the game. But Arkansas used a formula that was very similar to the formula that was used the week before when Kentucky upset Ole Miss. It never felt like there was a whole lot of rhythm. It never felt like Tennessee had a whole lot going on in the first half. Dylan Sampson really didn't get a lot of opportunities. And time of possession was dominated in one direction. 
So it was kind of a, a similar recipe for Arkansas to what we've seen in the past when slowing down these high-powered offenses that utilize tempo and really rely on tempo when you're watching the game. But at the beginning of the second half, I'm sitting there thinking, all right, Tennessee's figured it out, right? Bang, touchdown, bang, touchdown. I mean, right down the field, running the football. Sampson's starting to get ignited, starting to think, all right, well, hey, this is going to be a hey, great play in the first half, Hogs. But we'll see you next time. And sure enough, boom, big response from Arkansas. Go down, get it to 14-10, and then ultimately go and get it again, kick the field goal, which, by the way, Malachi Singleton, him stepping into that difficult spot in the red zone was tough enough. And then you're thinking, yeah, that was probably their best chance. Well, boom, they get it back. They go down the field. They score again. Did look like Tennessee allowed them to score, which I think was the correct call on Josh Heupel's part. I think future. In the future, you'd love to kind of kneel on that one if you're Arkansas and never give Nico Iamaleava the chance to go down and potentially put together a two-minute drill. They almost did. Nico lost track of how much time was left. He runs out of bounds, and that was just a tough moment for him. But a young player that will learn from that mistake. But an incredible performance for Sam Pittman, an incredible performance for their defense, for the most part, outside of a couple drives, man, they played great on defense against the team that was averaging a million points a game. So very, very impressive there. You look at Michigan, and and I thought Michigan was a bit of a paper tiger. I've been saying that all season long. This is not an I told you so, okay? It's not. Um, I don't think Michigan can win the way Michigan was wanting to win against most teams in the sport. You, you run into teams that are well coached. You run into teams that are that can match your physicality. You run into teams in certain circumstances. It's like if you want to play the way they were playing, you had a very, very thin margin against everyone that you were playing against. Now, what I will admit is that I did not anticipate Jack Tuttle coming off the bench, providing a bit of a spark. Now, I thought Tuttle, and I remember watching him in the pregame of the national championship last year, just sitting there on the on the on the field in pregame and and watching Tuttle throw him like this guy throws a nice ball. He's got a big arm and thinking, all right, I'm going to store that one for when we move forward. Now, Tuttle was banged up, never really had much of an opportunity to compete in spring and summer. And, and now maybe that he's healthy, maybe he is the best man for the job. It appears like he might be. But a couple critical mistakes lead to Washington winning on their home field and avenging the loss from the national championship game last year. I was very impressed with Washington because there was a moment where I felt like Michigan had kind of seized control. They had a couple drives there in the second half, late in the second half, where it felt like this would be where Michigan kind of imposed their will and put this game on ice. Like, think Michigan, you think that style of attack, you think they're going to get better there in the fourth quarter especially in a one-score game when they can take the air out of the football. That didn't happen. Two turnovers forced back-to-back -back drives, then gave Michigan, uh, then gave Washington, excuse me, an opportunity to secure the lead and press the gas pedal themselves. So an incredible performance, an incredible performance by Steve Belichick's defense. And I thought all in all, it was a gutsy performance from Will Rogers. And there's just a lot to like about what I saw from that Washington team. That was a big win. Jonah Coleman had some really, really nice runs for Washington as well. That was a really hard-fought team victory. They were opportunistic, and they got the job done. So very, very proud of that performance. Uh, USC losing to Minnesota. This is one that was a little bit surprising because I really like USC. I'm going to be honest. I had told you last week, I thought USC is a really good football team. I think they've improved in a lot of ways. They've done a really good job of being able to utilize a passing attack that has great weapons and guys take their turns and, and filling it up. What I did not anticipate was them going, <laughs> oh my goodness, excuse me. Um, obviously, the allergy medicine not kicking in just yet here on Always College Football, so I apologize. I don't have a cough button, so I would have pressed that, but I don't know what to press. I just... You guys are with me. We're talking ball. We're just sitting here having coffee on a Sunday morning. 
But I look at SC, and I thought Brosmer for Minnesota had a really solid game. I thought the offensive plan for Minnesota was solid as well. But it was really kind of befuddling to see SC struggle as much as they struggled. The couple picks didn't play very well. And I know statistically speaking, Minnesota had come into this game with one of the best defenses in the sport, especially through the air. Their pass defense was number one in college football. They allowed less than 100 yards a game. And it was, I thought, kind of a fugazi. I didn't trust it. I didn't believe it because I looked at who they played and I thought they haven't been challenged like SC is going to challenge them. Sure enough, they were up to the task. They played really well and they capped it off with their first win against an AP top 15 when trailing entering the fourth quarter since 1999. So a gutsy and resilient performance there. The last one in the top 10 that, frankly, should Missouri have been in the top 10? Let's be real. I mean, I've been somewhat unimpressed with what I've seen from Missouri all season long. I watched them. I've studied them. I thought now the Vanderbilt performance makes a little more sense, doesn't it? I thought that they had just kind of played to the level of the competition. They weren't really challenged in the first two weeks. And then, hey, we'll see what they're all about against Boston College. They come out kind of a slow start down 14-3. They somehow find a way to flip the script and turn it on. Fast forward to the game against Vandy. You're sitting there, golly, on their home field to play that close to Vandy. Well, Vandy's actually quite good and quite dangerous. But on the other side of the coin, still had question marks about this passing attack. For whatever reason, when you watch Missouri this year, the offense just doesn't have the same level of simplicity it had last year. I remember watching them last year and thinking, golly, their their stretch zones, their off-tackle runs, the way they marry up their stretch zone with play action, the way they're able to constantly find Luther Burden in a one-on-one situation. It's just, for whatever reason, the rhythm has not been there. And there's also been a couple self-inflicted mistakes. There was a big self-inflicted mistake in a touchdown that was wiped off the board early in the game. And maybe, hey, if that touchdown on the illegal man downfield isn't wiped off, is there a scenario where this game looks very different? I'm not sure. I do know this. I know that AM is quite good and real talented. And I'm also very impressed with what I've seen from this rushing attack. Le'Veon Moss, the last couple weeks, there are a few people that I've seen running harder than him. I mean, this guy is fighting for every yard running through guys. And I saw some open field speed that I wasn't, I didn't know was in there. I mean, he was able to took off and he was running away from the defense a couple of times as well. It's great to see Wigman back in there. We had been talking for a while about is Marcel Reed the better option? And frankly, I was kind of leaning in that direction, just knowing where the offense was going, knowing that there were a couple question marks at wide receiver knowing that maybe this is going to be a run-first style of attack. The offensive line had done a good job in the run game this year. Well, Wigman now, with some of the throws, I mean, he fit it into some tight windows, some very tight windows in the game and softened up that coverage, which allowed for the run game to go. So that, I think, if we can bottle up that performance from Texas A&M and apply it multiple times down the stretch, look out, guys. Texas A&M right now is still a sleeper but they could find their way in the back door and make things very, very interesting. They have a big opportunity against Texas on their home field. They have an opportunity against LSU. They have several other games on their schedule that I think have a chance to kind of vault up their resume, vault up their strength of record. And now that they're through this one, they're in a really good position. They're in a really good position moving forward to potentially make some noise. Let's go to the nightcap, one that I'm, Still uh, wrapping my head around. I thought Brock Osweiler articulated it very, very well at the end of the game. Very, very impressed with how he handled the targeting, no targeting situation at the end. This was a game that I thought Miami was outplayed really for the first 48 minutes of the game, it felt like. I mean, to be in the hole like that, to be deep in the hole, and really not looking like there was going to be much of a chance to get back in the mix. I mean, it was tough sledding to be down 35-10 
And frankly, for your quarterback to be, I mean, he's running to his right, throwing it back across his body, throwing jump balls. Like Cam Ward did not play great. He had some great moments, but he did not play great. Um, he, However, it's his fifth 400-yard passing game over the last two years. That's the most in the FBS. So there were things that were good about what he did, especially in in getting things started, hitting Restrepo on the deep over, getting the drive going. I mean, backed up, flipping the field, huge play that ended up being the game-winning drive. So there was a lot to like about what I've seen from him. But to me, the biggest moment in the game felt like the targeting that was wiped out. And I don't know why it was. Look, targeting, it's either you have defenseless player which qualifies as a quarterback, a receiver that's going up to make a play, uh, a guy that's down on the ground who's already down. Those people are considered defenseless. And then you have runners. And I mean, the defenseless player, there's a few extra layers that you have to, a few extra boxes that you have to check for it to be considered targeting on the defenseless player. In this case, it's a crown of the helmet situation. And to me, I don't know how that wasn't targeting. I think by every, I, I just don't understand it. And I, I feel like I know the rules pretty well. Take pride in trying to be very knowledgeable about the rules. That to me was targeting. I, I, that's what I thought. And had it been called targeting, that would have resulted in a automatic first down, which would have probably put the game on ice for Cal. So really disappointing finish for Justin Wilcox on was a monumental day for Cal football, but you also have to give credit to Miami. This is now two weeks in a row in which they played about their C minus game, maybe D plus, and still found a way to escape. Virginia Tech, that team's looking better and better. They went and hammered Stanford. So maybe Virginia Tech's actually who we thought they were. I mean, they lost to Vandy and everyone wrote them off for dead. Well, maybe Vandy's good. I mean, you know, these are these are backwards world ideas, but certainly possible and potentially probable. But looking at Miami to play that poorly and to escape at 1.30 Central Time, 2.30 Miami time, and to still be playing football was pretty remarkable. And I think that that was, were they fortunate? Absolutely. Do they have anything to apologize for? No. When you're given new life, you have to seize that opportunity, and they did. So you got to give them credit for that. But, man, they got things to figure out on defense. Uh, there were a few moments in which they had opportunities to drop Francisco Mendoza and they didn't they'd either grab a face mask or whatever it may be so there's certainly a lot to clean up for Miami on the defensive side Ohio State rolled thought they would great third quarter performance coming out after halftime and just leaving no doubt the defense looks excellent by the way and that sets up what should be an incredible game next week between Ohio State and Oregon who was victorious on Friday against Michigan State Speaking of Friday, how about Cuse? We had a good week, by the way. A really good week with the Giant Killers. We loved Florida. We loved Cuse. We loved Texas Tech. Uh, we loved Arkansas. We had a good week with the Giant Killers. But either way, man, Cuse handles their business on the road at UNLV. Georgia, I thought a very methodical performance from Georgia. Game probably a little closer than the final score would indicate. There was a moment there, down 21-10, where Auburn had the ball in a fourth down situation. Peyton Thorne looked like he checked out of a play, which and whatever he checked into was a play that was never in a million years going to work. I'm not sure what the protocols are at Auburn and whether Peyton has the freedom to check there or if he can if he can trump a call with a, against a certain look. I don't know what the decision making was, but that was a critical, critical play in the game. And if they convert that game, it's probably uh, convert that play. It's probably a very different looking football game. Penn State, kind of a ho hum performance offensively. I think there's room to grow there. We'll find out where they're at here in a week when they take on SC. But defensively, they continued to be extremely impressive. Didn't give up hardly anything, it seemed like, until the very end when UCLA was able to put up that trash score 
which really doesn't matter. Ole Miss and South Carolina. Ole Miss, people thinking, man, I don't know how Ole Miss is good. They couldn't block Kentucky. How are they going to block South Carolina? Well, they did so very, very impressively in a 24-point first quarter. But this story for Ole Miss was really more about the defense. Just an excellent, excellent defensive performance. And South Carolina really couldn't get a whole lot going. I think South Carolina has a lot of challenges on offense for sure. But man, alive, that was really, really impressive from what we saw from the Rebs. Clemson handles Florida State. Incredible start to the game and cruising to the finish line. 17 points, kill their will right out of the gate and put it on ice. Boise State, Ashton GT is the best player right now, pound for pound in the sport. Uh, he is absolutely outrageous through five games. He's already over a thousand yards. He might, as we fast forward to the end of the year, I mean, he's on pace for like 2,700 yards. Uh, it was not completely unthinkable. Just saying, it is not completely unthinkable to think that Ashton GT can't get to beyond 2,500. He might even flirt with 3,000. I mean, the guy is just absolutely ridiculous. And you think Heisman too. We don't talk Heisman. You guys know this. We will talk Heisman in November because that's when the award is won. Traditionally, if you're a running back and you go for over 2,000, you're in the mix. Well, he's halfway there with potentially eight games to play. So I think I feel pretty confident in thinking that he's going to get to at least 2,000. And if he goes well beyond 2,000, it's a very real possibility he could bring home the most coveted individual award in the sport, even though I don't think there's a lot of people watching his games and he might not have a lot of, quote, Heisman moments, but he's incredible. If you have some time in the future, check it out because it is awesome to watch. Indiana gets to 6-0. and uh, Really impressive fourth quarter performance there. It was close with Northwestern. And then they put their foot on the gas. Curtis Rourke continues to be a revelation. He's thrown for nearly 400 again this past weekend. Ridiculous. SMU, 5-1. and one. And how about the response from SMU? They lose to BYU a couple weeks ago. You're sitting there thinking, man, I don't know. You tried to make a change at quarterback. You put in Jennings at quarterback. Man, he's been every bit as advertised in the run game. But the throw game at times looked a little better against Louisville. And man, live. I mean, Louisville, a lot of challenges on the defensive side. I thought they'd play a much better game. I thought Louisville was going to get this win. I thought they'd get it at home. Hey, SMU's been coming in. They're riding high. But SMU is now 2-0 and in the ACC. And when you look at the ACC right now, all right, we know, my, I mean, obviously Miami survived. They're still undefeated in the league. Clemson is undefeated in the league. SMU is undefeated in the league. There's a lot of potential drama that could be coming in the ACC rather soon. I'm sure there's something that I'm missing here in the show, but we'll put a bow on it with this. Uh, the greatest neutralizer, it used to be turnovers and explosive plays. That's how upsets happen. Turnovers and explosive plays. If you can create explosives, you're in a really good spot. And if you can turn the opposing team over, you're in a really good spot as well. I'd like to now add third down conversions and time of possession. People in the tempo era have said, oh, time of possession doesn't matter. It's a fake stat. Tell that to Alabama, who had 17 minutes of time of possession against Vanderbilt's 42 and change. Bama had 17 and change. Uh, look at the third down and fourth down conversions for Vanderbilt. 13 of 19 to be able to sustain drives. You look at Tennessee. Look at the first quarter for Tennessee and how much the time of possession was skewed towards Arkansas and how disruptive that was. Look back last week where Kentucky pulled off the upset against Ole Miss. And at one point, they had a 3-1 to one time of possession. They had had it for 21 minutes. Ole Miss had had it for seven these things are starting to become a little bit more of a factor when teams are heavily reliant on tempo. And I know Tennessee's numbers ultimately got back to like 35-25 or 36-24 or whatever it is. These teams that heavily rely on tempo and these teams that heavily rely on rhythm offensively, owning the time of possession is significant, really significant. So that's something that maybe is worth monitoring. Maybe we'll assess that tomorrow on our deeper dive show 
that we always do on Mondays, our 10 takeaways. So if you did not hear anything about your team, if there's a story that you want to talk more about, we're probably going to get into it tomorrow. We will do our top 10 things we've learned from week six of the college football season. We look forward to that show very much. We love our Monday show, so we're going to dive in. I got my iPad right here. I got my games loaded. I'm about to go into work mode for sure. But we appreciate, as always, all of you being with us here on a Sunday edition of Always College Football. Check back tomorrow. Let's deep, do a deeper dive. and Let's try to figure out where this world's going after a chaotic, and hectic week that saw five teams in the top 11 fall to unranked opponents. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have an awesome day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.